right. I'm going to record this lecture without the um, the the camera. All right, all right one. Le I'll give you on the code. You got the code? Hello. All right. Okay. All right. Let's get started. Um, I'm going to go ahead and record this lecture without the camera. The camera, for some reason, on this machine is showing up really bright, and, I'm, and I was messing with the settings, but I think this camera and this camera are actually like linked together, and so I was having trouble messing with, or fixing one brightness without the other. So, um, so let's go ahead and get started. Um, right now, uh, we are in, you know, sort of this uh, general cycle of, uh, of, you know, we have a lecture and then a homework and then a follow-up with another homework, and so we're rocking and rolling. I'm, I'm pulling up the syllabus right now because uh, I wanted to mention when the, uh, the next uh, exam or the first exam is because it's coming up sooner rather than later. Let me see. So the first exam is on Wednesday, September 21st. So what that means is we're going to have lecture today. Then we're going to have lecture Monday, Wednesday, Friday. Then following Monday, we will come in and do our exam review. Uh, and then uh, we will have our first celebration of learning that following Wednesday. So I just wanted to put that on your, your uh, calendars to sort of keep in mind, like we do have a, a celebration of learning coming up. You know? So historic day, I know, yesterday with all the news. So... Uh, Wanted to make sure that our minds were back in the wonderful world of Engineering 213. Okay, any questions on logistics? All right, so uh, TAs have graded homework 2.2. They're working on 2.3, uh, but I have the solution posted for these. Homework 2.4 is due today, and so I'll assign homework 2.5, and it'll be due uh, on Monday. <laughs> so with that, uh, let's go ahead and get started. Um, what we're going to do is we're going to sort of continue on our discussion of 2D equilibrium. And I wanna do an additional example. This one actually has more vectors. Um, so I think that there's added value in, uh, in, instead of dealing with a problem that just has three vectors at a point, but there's four, the angle and the orientation of those vectors is defined a little differently than it was uh, in the, the last uh, problem or the last homework assignment. But one of the added benefits is that because of the way that this problem is framed, we actually don't need to use matrix algebra to solve the problem. We can actually do it uh, uh, pretty directly. And, and that'll make sense as we get into the, um, the, the guts of the problem, as it were. And then I want to um, take a little bit of a tangent off to the side, and I want to talk about pulleys. Um, it's, a, uh, it, it's not a very big topic. It's, it's really a, a short uh, uh, conceptual lecture, but um, uh, these are some, some classical problems that you might see on the FE exam. Uh, you might just, they're, they're, they're short and they're little, almost kind of like riddles, but they're not, um, they're not all that difficult if you, uh, if you have an understanding of how to look at them. Okay, so uh, let's make sure we're recalling just what we're using here uh, in static equilibrium. So, um, you know, up until now, what we've done is we've learned how to describe vectors and how to add them. Um, and basically what we're saying for uh, systems that are in static equilibrium, that the sum of those vectors must be equal to zero. Well, if we write that in IJ notation, if we're talking about two-dimensional systems, then we're basically dealt with uh, or resulting in two equations, two unknowns. We know that the uh, sum of those vectors must be zero I plus zero J, and that has to equal whatever the sum of the X components times I is and whatever the sum of the Y components times J is. So that then naturally means that the sum of the forces in the x direction must be equal to zero and the sum of the forces in the y direction must be equal to zero. Uh, and so that yields two equations and then ultimately two unknowns. And, and I'll say one little tidbit about that. In this class, we are only going to deal with systems that are statically determinant. And what that means is that um, we have uh, the same number of unknown quantities as we do equations of equilibrium. So, for example, in two-dimensional problems, we in this class will only deal with situations where there are two unknowns, okay? Now, that doesn't mean that happens in the real world. Sometimes in the real world, you have a, a system where there are uh, two equations of equilibrium, but there are multiple unknowns. That happens all the time. Uh, you know, a, a good example of that, forgive the, the bridge engineer who keeps thinking about bridges, but if you have a multi-span bridge that has a series of, of piers on it, 
and it's all one solid uh, beam across those piers, each one of those support reactions is an unknown, and you have more unknowns than you do equations of equilibrium. And that's called a statically indeterminate system. And we as engineers deal with static indeterminacy all the time, but the only way to assess that is to understand the relationship between how much force you apply and how much resulting deformations that you get. So next semester when you take engineering 216 or you biomedicals take, uh, I think when you take BME 302, you're going to learn about the relationship between applied stresses and resulting strains and how are re resulting strains and how bodies deform under uh, applied loads. In this class, we're basically assuming everything is a rigid body. So you start out assuming everything's rigid and then later on you, you add the, uh, the concept of deformation. So I just wanted to make sure that everybody knew that I'm not going to give you a problem where there's more unknowns than there are equations of equilibrium. Okay. All right. So the last thing, make sure you recall the acceleration due to gravity. I hope everybody remembered on problem one on the homework that that was in terms of mass. So you needed to multiply that 120 kilograms times gravity to get that mass in terms of force. I see some people shaking their head like, yeah, I remember that. And some people looking at me going, oh. Whoops, we're supposed to do that. Yeah, that first problem was in uh, was in mass. So the idea was that it was in kilograms. We need to convert that to newtons <laughs> by multiplying that by uh, by nine point eight one meters per second squared. Okay, all right. So with that, I want to give I want to look at another example. Now this example is actually going to have four unknowns because there are four vectors being applied through point A. But I have a model here shown, and I'm going to determine the tension in this cable AC, and I'm gonna determine the drag force on this hull to keep the boat in place. So the idea is I have a, a barge or a boat in some canal or some uh, river, and the water is flowing, obviously wanting to push the boat down the river, and we have a series of cables that are um, keeping the, the barge in place. Now this is a scale model, so obviously, you know, um, if we were talking about something in the real world, the tension in some cable holding a full-scale barge or river wouldn't be 40 pounds. Uh, so this is you know, obviously some scale model. But what we have here is we have three cables holding this, um, uh, this, this uh, scale barge in place. We have cable AB, cable AC, and cable AE. So we have three cables holding it in place, and then the drag force um, uh, pushing the, wanting to push the barge down the river. So there are four forces, but two of them we know. We know that the tension in this cable is 40 pounds, and we know the tension in this cable is 60 pounds. And so what we want to know is what if, if this cable is experiencing 40 pounds and this cable is experiencing 60 pounds, what's the drag force and what's the tension in this cable in order to achieve equilibrium? Okay, so let me pull out the notebook and we'll start getting to work on this. So... Now, what's interesting is that there's probably some of you thinking this is this sounds more complicated than the one we just did for the homework assignment and the one we just did uh, in class last time. And in some ways, it's a little bit more involved, but in other ways, as we actually start getting into the solution strategy, it will be easier, okay? Uh, and that'll become clear as we get into this, okay? So we've got um, four forces being applied, and they're all being applied through point A, so the first thing I'm going to do is um, uh, draw a free body diagram of the um, uh, 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 particle A and look at all of those forces. Let's do that first. Okay. So... We'll say that this is my point here, and, and I'm going to use some, some color coordination here. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to draw, now these are tension forces in these cables. So I'm going to say that this uh, force here, we'll call this tension AE, and then we're going to call this one right here, we'll call this, Tension A B. Okay, so let me move the mouse pointer. Now, um, where I said I'm going to be color coordinated, I'm going to draw this one right here in blue. Tension, bless you. A C. Uh, and then there is a fourth force. Okay, 
The fourth force is this flow or this drag force wanting to push the, um, uh, the, the barge down the river. So what we're going to do is we're going to apply a fourth force right here. And I'm going to call this FD. Okay, so drag force. Okay. Now, before we move away from this, um, one thing I want to mention is that we do not know what that angle is right now, and we do not know what that angle is right now. So those are sort of the complexities that we really didn't have to deal with on the last problem, but instead of being given angles, what we were given were dimensions that defined the proportions of the cable. So we can use these dimensions to determine these angles, okay? So let me give some, I'm gonna, I'm gonna come up with some names for these angles instead of just question marks so that we're kind of all talking about the same thing. So we'll call this one theta two. We'll call this one, I don't know, theta one. Just, just so that we're all sort of speaking the same language uh, as it were. Okay, so we obviously need to find theta one and theta two because theta one and theta two will allow us to express these vectors in IJ notation according to our, our, our sign convention that we've, um, uh, the, 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 our, our notation, our convention, as it were, that we've uh, uh, adopted. The other thing I will note is just make sure that everybody is aware that TAB or the magnitude of the vector TAB is 40 pounds and TAE or the magnitude of that vector is 60 pounds. So let's, you know, just make sure that we're all, you know, familiar with that. Here, I'll just box that right here. Okay. All right. Oh, I went, went a little far with that scroll. Okay, so far so good? Okay, so the first thing I want to do is I want to describe these vectors. So if we go, so we're going to follow the same general process that we did last time from a conceptual standpoint. So we're going to take each of these vectors, we're going to describe them in IJ notation, and then we're going to sum them up. Then we're going to look at each component, the sum of the forces in the x direction, the sum of the forces in the y direction, to determine our unknowns. And what are our unknowns in this problem? Well, the unknowns in this problem are we don't know this, and we don't know this. That's what we don't know. Okay, but we do need to describe all of the vectors in this problem in order to be able to address it. So let's take, let's take care of that. So the first thing I'm going to do is compute angles. Okay. Now notice how in the problem we're given alpha and beta. Let, let's sort of just solve for those first, okay? Let's, let's just take care of those first. So let's take care of alpha. So how could we determine this angle alpha? Well, we're given this sort of right triangle figure like that. So we know that this is seven feet. We know that's four feet. So would you agree that the tangent of alpha is... Uh, seven feet over four feet. Would you agree with that? So that means that alpha is the inverse tangent of seven feet over four feet, which is what? We'll say that in two decimal places. What do we get for alpha? By the way, did everybody see the playlist I posted? I don't know if I got all of the calculators in that uh, list, so if there's anything missing, let me know. Which 
Do I have a second on that? Yeah. Okay. All right. Now, let's go ahead and do beta while we're at it. So I think we can do the same thing. So I would argue that the tangent of beta is opposite over adjacent. So 1.5 feet over 4 feet. I think we can do that. So beta is the inverse tangent of that. 1. 0.5 feet over 4 feet. So what is beta? Sixty-nine. Not, wait, is that? Wait, 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 wait. I think you've got that backwards. There we go. Twenty point five six. Yeah, and and we're gonna get to how how that relates to theta one and theta two here in a second. But but yeah. Everybody okay with this? All right, now I've computed alpha and beta because you know that's what's referenced here in the problem, but that's not what I really need. What I really need are these theta one and theta twos. So based on the values that I've computed so far, can somebody tell me how would I compute theta one? Yes. 90 minus alpha. There we go, 90 minus alpha, which I think I can do that one in my head. That's about 30 or 29.74. Yeah. I do that right. And then theta two similarly is going to be 90 minus beta. And 90 minus beta, so that's 69.44. That's the value I think you got a second ago. So far so good? So now that we have our angles defined, I think we can start getting into vector description land pretty easily, okay? So let's look at vector description. Okay? And again, if you uh, see anything or if there's any uh, uh, symbols I'm writing that you can't read, let me know. Okay. So vector description, we have four vectors on this problem. So let's handle them one at a time. Let's start off with TAB. Okay, so how do we generally write a, a vector? We have a pile of junk times I plus a pile of junk times J. And then what we do inside that vector or inside those components is we take the magnitude times the cosine of the associated angle and the magnitude times the sine of the associated angle. And now we, we took our time and got the angles correct. Like we know we're referencing the right angles because that's where the value of our free body diagram came into play and uh, the, the value of looking at our angles first before we started nose diving into the um, uh, uh, description of the vectors. So, I think we've got this part figured out pretty well. Um, so now first off, do we know the magnitude of AB? Bless you. Do we know the magnitude of AB? Yes. We were given that, and what was it? 40 pounds. So what I can do is I can say this is 40 pounds times the cosine of 29.74 degrees. Is there something wrong with that? Should be a negative. There you go. Make sure everybody's awake this morning. Plus, now is this one negative? No, because it's going upwards. So 40 pounds times the sine of 29.74 degrees times J. And so for vector AB, we don't have variables built into it. They're actually just numbers, okay? So what do we get for the I component of uh, vector AB or TAB? We'll say like two decimal places. Negative 34.73. Right. 34 do I have a second? And that's I plus 
plus. And what somebody else, what do we get for J? Nineteen point eight four pounds. Do I have a second? All right, cool. All right. So there we go. So there's that vector defined. And again, notice how it's there's no variables here because we knew what the magnitude of that one was. Okay. Now, what about vector AC? Okay. So vector AC, we're going to follow the same pattern. So TAC cosine. In this case, it's theta two, right? So now we've got um, TAC cosine theta 2 times I, TAC sine theta 2 times J. So same pattern, just different magnitudes, different angles. Now, for this one, okay, so let's handle a couple things first. Are these positive terms, negative terms? What's the deal with each of these? They're both positive. This is vector AC right here, okay, and it's in quadrant 1. I have a laser pointer, maybe I ought to use it. So this is vector AC right here, so it's going to the right and going up. There's a fly here on the screen. All right, so we have uh, this component times I, this component times J, and they're both gonna be positive. Now the second question is, do we know the magnitude of vector AC right now? No, we don't. So we're gonna leave this in symbolic terms, as it were. So we're gonna have TAC, cosine of 69.44 degrees times I plus TAC sine 69.44 degrees times J. And that's it. I'm actually, I'm going to stop there. I, I, we can go ahead and evaluate these cosines if, if we want. I don't think right now we really need to, so I'm just going to leave it like that. But everybody okay so far? Okay, now we've got two more vectors here. Let's talk about vector um, AE. What would, how would we describe this vector? So first, first off, there's a component times I plus a component times J. What's the component times I? Zero, there is, it's only a vertical vector. So it's just going to be the magnitude of this vector times j. Is it positive or negative? Negative. Do we know the magnitude of vector a? What is it? 60 pounds. So wouldn't then this just be that? That's it, right? Okay, so if that's the case, How do we describe this vector? Horizontal. It's horizontal, so is there a J component? But there's an I component. Is it positive or negative? Do we know the magnitude? No. So it's just the magnitude times I, right? FD. Times I. And that's it. Those are our vectors. And here, let me... So if we wanted to describe our vectors, they're done, right? We've computed our angles, that's done. Here's vector AB, here's vector AC, here's TAE, here's uh, our drag force, and that's it. Those are our four vector descriptions, right? So what's the next step conceptually? I've described each of my vectors, and if I want to apply the principles of static equilibrium, what do I do to these four vectors? And I write the equations of static equilibrium by doing what to the vectors? Somebody else said it. Add them up. I'm going to add each of these four vectors. And the equations of static equilibrium are just going to be looking at the x components, looking at the y components, summing them up and setting them equal to zero. Now, there's with this problem, though, there's, there's sort of a, um, a serendipitous finding that you're going to see here. So let me look at equations of 
static equilibrium. I'm all about having game plans before you just, you know, jump right into the calculations. So let's develop one of those game plans. And so what I'm going to do is this. There's four vectors. All right, let's write these vectors out. All right, so TAB is negative 34.73 pounds in here. TAC is TAC cosine 69.44 degrees. And these are the I components. Oh, I put uh, AD, that's AE. Marshall University policy says I'm allowed seven mistakes per semester in my, cal in my calculation. But the thing is, like, I'm the one who keeps track of the mistake counter, so it's a corrupt system. I know, it's, it's a shame. Okay, so um, <laughs> what goes in here for um, the AE vector? If I were to write, like, something times I plus something times J, what goes in the AE vector right here? Nothing. Nothing. And this is FD. Plus, 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 plus. See how I'm doing this? See how I'm kind of writing it in this systematic sort of tabular fashion? So let's, let's keep going with this and see what happens. So this is 19.84 pounds. This is TAC sine 69.44 pounds. And again, these are times, oh, times J, not I. All right, um, this is negative 60 pounds. And what goes in here? That's zero, right? Okay. I wanna let everybody catch up to this because I wanna be smart about this if I can. I'm lazy, if I can do this problem with as few calculator strokes as possible, as few pencil strokes as possible, I'm happy. I don't need 12 pages of calculations for a problem that can take me five minutes. I'm an engineer, I'm not a mathematician. So. Okay, so I didn't say that. So don't tell them in the math. Somebody really didn't like I said that because you dropped the calculator. I like my calculator, what are you talking about? Okay, so I want to talk about strategy here okay so let's talk about how we did this in the last example and in your last homework assignment so in your last homework assignment what we did is as the gentleman said we applied the equations of static equilibrium and so we summed up everything here and got an equation and then we summed up everything here and we got an equation so we had two equations two unknowns plugged it into our equation solver got our answers went home and to be crystal clear, that will work here as well. There's nothing to say that we can't do that. But I want to be a little forward thinking about this. So let's look at this equation. Okay, so this is going to be the sum of the forces in the x direction. So if I sum forces in the x direction, what I'm going to do is I'm going to be summing everything that is in the red box. <coughs> Correct? How many unknowns are in the red box? Two. I have the tension in this vector and the magnitude of this vector. Those are two unknowns. Now that's the sum of the forces in the x direction. So this right here is summing forces in the x direction. Now let's sum forces in the y direction. That means summing everything in the blue box the blue box with the bump in it. How many unknowns are in the blue box? One, right? And the reason for that is because one of our unknown vectors is purely horizontal, right? So the other unknown has components in the X and Y direction. If I look at summing the forces in the Y direction, the only unknown is TAC. 
Okay. So what I mean by forward thinking, forward strategy is if I were being sort of mechanical or robotic about this, I would just do it alphabetically. Some forces in the X direction, some forces in the Y direction. But wouldn't it make sense to do this one first? If I sum this one first, I'm going to get an equation that only has one unknown. I can solve that equation and get an answer for TAC right now. Let's see how that works. Let's sum forces in the Y direction. So what do we get? We get 19.84 pounds plus TAC. I said, now there's a mistake that I caught. 69.44 degrees. I said 69.44 pounds. That doesn't count because I caught it. Again, you know, it's a corrupt system. All right, minus 60 pounds equals zero. So would it be fair to say that TAC is, so how would I do that? I'd take 60 pounds over here. I'd subtract the 19.84 pounds, and I would divide that by the sine of 69.44 degrees. Is that a fair statement? So by being systematic about it, I can actually just solve it directly. So what do I get if I uh, plug and chug this? What's my answer? Forty two point eight nine pounds. Do I have a second on that? Everybody brought their Casio FX 115 ES plus or similar scientific calculator. Am I correct? Yep. So there's there there's there's three groups of students. I think there's the ones that brought the calculator, the ones that didn't, and then the ones that brought the calculator, but it's in our backpacks. Okay. <laughs> I'm just playing around. Okay, so now if we sum forces in the x direction, so I can write this out, I can say negative 34.73 pounds I don't know about you, but I kind of like putting all the signs inside the parentheses because I think it's kind of easier to just look inside the parentheses and add all the terms up. It reduces mistakes. So, and I'm all about reducing mistakes. It might be a little bit more pencil strokes, but um, I think in this instance, it's worth it. So here's our expression. But because we did this one second, okay, because we did this one second, we now know what TAC is. We have that right here. So I can plug and chug, and I can say, therefore, FD is... But that's 34.73 pounds minus, and then that's 42.89 cosine 69.44 degrees. And so what do we get for our drag force? Nineteen sixty seven. Do I have a second? All right. So notice how the problem looked more challenging, but I don't really think it was, you know, because the way that the unknowns came about, we could actually be kind of strategic about that. I'm going to tell you that's going to be a theme later on in the semester. So for example, when we start looking at rigid bodies and we start doing things like computing support reactions, we're going to have, so first off, when we get down that road, we're going to have additional equations of equilibrium because not only are we gonna have sum of forces you know, in, in certain directions, but we're gonna have sum of moments in certain directions. And without getting 
too far down the rabbit hole of what moments are and, and how we deal with them in this course, there is a similar layer of strategy that we will deal with when uh, uh, determining those types of reaction forces. So when we're looking at, let's say, beams, and we want to determine the support reactions on the end of those beams, what we will often do is sum moments first, and we will sum moments in particular locations as to eliminate unknowns. And that's kind of the strategy that we did here. We uh, could have done this one first, but we would have had two unknowns. By dealing with the sum of the forces in the y direction first, we were eliminating a lot of unknowns. So we were able to deal with a problem that only had one unknown, and it became a very simple algebra problem. And then we substituted that into this equation, and it, uh, in turn, became another very simple algebra problem. No need for hyper-fancy uh, computations. So, again, I'll keep it as simple whenever we can. Sound good? Any questions about the concept? But you're going to have a problem very similar to this on your next time on time. Okay. After this, so we're going to talk about pulleys now, but after this we will take these concepts and extend them into three dimensions. And you'll find that they're not harder, just a little bit longer. You'll find the process very, uh, very rough. Okay. So we're going to talk here in a second about pulleys. But I want to take a step back and sort of explain what's going on with pulley problems. To be clear, I, I don't think that in the grand scheme of Engineering 213, pulleys are the biggest deal in the world. But I do think that pulley problems are kind of worth talking about in the sense that um, uh, they do help enforce your understanding of, of static equilibrium. So what I mean by a pulley problem is we have some object that is being supported by pulleys, and, and we are assuming that the pulleys are frictionless, so there's no forces beyond what's in the rope and what's uh, from the, uh, the weight of the box. So we have these pulley systems here, and the idea is to determine the tension in the rope that is required to keep the object upright, okay? Now, the secret with pulley problems is to recognize that the tension is constant throughout the entirety of the cable. So, for example, if I'm looking at this really odd one over here on the right, if I look at any point here in the cable, you know, from here all the way down, the tension in the cable is taken as T. So, if T is, let's say in this problem, T is 100 pounds. T is 100 pounds everywhere along the length of the cable. But the question is, how exactly do I determine what T is, okay? I'm going to introduce you to one of the secret weapons of engineering mechanics, which is either a samurai sword or a lightsaber if you happen to be a sci-fi fan, okay? This is a tool known as cutting a section, okay? So we're going to be doing this a lot uh, later on in this semester, and the concept of cutting a section is something you're going to be doing throughout a variety of engineering courses during your time here at Marshall. And so the easiest way to explain cutting a section is to, for example, look at this table. Okay, so this table's a little short for my, uh, for my example, but we'll just kind of use it to make the point. Ooh, that's spooky. All right, so let's say that I am sitting here on this table. and I'm, I'm sitting down on the table, okay? Let's say Elaine doesn't like me very much, so she has either a samurai sword or a lightsaber. She's a sci-fi fan, and she cuts through the table right here while I'm sitting on it, okay? What happens to me in that instance? I fall down. What happens to her grade? <laughs> that, I'm, that's a joke. Okay, I'm done. All right. So, now why? Why do I fall down? Okay, why do I fall down? The reason that I fall down is because inside the table at this particular point, there are forces holding me up. There are forces inside the table that are keeping me in equilibrium, right? By going through the process of cutting a section with a samurai sword or lightsaber or what have you, the idea is that I am saying, okay, I am releasing from the table the ability to resist those forces. Then later on, I can start applying the equations of static equilibrium to figure out what were those forces that kept me in equilibrium. And where that becomes important from an engineering context is that if I'm an engineer and I'm designing this table and I know that the internal forces inside the table are 
400 pounds or 600 pounds or what have you, I can then become an engineer and say, what thickness does this board need to be? What element do I need to select for this tabletop in order to safely resist the loads that I'm subjecting to it? And whether I'm talking about a table or a bridge or a dam or a, you know, a car or an airplane or a pacemaker or what have you, that's the fundamentals of engineering right there. Okay? So this is an incredibly important concept. And so we are very, we are just dipping our toes into the waters of cutting a section right now with pulley exercises. So I have here a, a very basic set of problems here just to kind of illustrate the point, okay? So if the box shown here in the figures, let's say this box here represents 600 pounds of force. And by the box, I mean the box and sort of everything attached to the box, okay? So if you look at these problems, you're going to see situations where there's the box, and then there's the, the ceiling up top, okay? So if I'm looking at, let's say, this system right here, how much tension is inside the cable such that it is safely supporting this box of 600 pounds? Well, we can look at that pretty easily with our samurai sword or lightsaber, if you happen to be a sci-fi fan, okay? Now, the way that we're gonna do that is we are going to take our samurai sword or lightsaber and we are going to cut through the, uh, through the cable right there near the box, okay? So for this first one, let's say this is 600 pounds, and so that's 600 pounds acting downwards, okay? What about this first one right here? So I'm gonna cut right here, okay? And so what I am considering the box, again, is the box and all of the pulleys that are attached to it. So like all of this, all of this, all of this, all of this, and even like all this linkage and whatnot right here, okay? So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna cut through the box or through the, the, the cables at the pulley right there, and I'm gonna say, okay, what do we got right here from a free body diagram standpoint? Well, I've got 600 pounds pulling down but how many ropes did I cut through in that samurai sword or lightsaber cut? Two. Two. And I've got, one, they're both sort of acting upwards because they're in tension. Like think, if I'm, if here's the pulley and I've got the ropes, the ropes are applying a tension acting upwards. So I have a T acting upwards, a T acting upwards. So if I were to sum forces in the Y direction, I would get two T going up 600 pounds going down, what's T? 300 pounds. Make sense? Not too hard, right? So all we're doing is we're just investigating this from an equilibrium standpoint. It's actually the same problems that we were doing before. It's just a little bit more graphical this time. Okay, so to help me out with this and make sure that we're good, which one am I doing now? Sorry, I think it's this one. Let's look at this one right here. So I'm curious if somebody can look at this and tell me what's the tension in the cable this time if the box is 600 pounds. It's 200 pounds, right? Because if I samurai sword or lightsaber through the cables right there, I'm cutting through three of them. Pretty simple, right? That's pretty much it when it comes to pulley problems. That, that's pretty much all there is to it. Um, the only thing that we have yet to really discuss uh, in this uh, endeavor, and I don't think we're going to have time to get to it today, um, is how pulleys can be integrated into later problems in the class. And so I have an example here uh, that looks like this. And so what we have is we have a 50 pound weight um, and the way, that it's, the way that it's being applied to the shaft is there's this frictionless uh, sleeve that's going along the, uh, the, the shaft. And what's happening is the pulley is uh, uh, transmitting this vertical load into this sort of angled load here on this vector. And the question is, what's the horizontal load required to keep that weight from dropping? I think what we'll do is we'll probably uh, save that problem uh, until um, Monday. Um, or if you would like, so we can do this one of two ways. Um, 
This is what? This is actually a really short problem, but I'm not going to be able to do it in five minutes. It'll probably take me like 10 or 15. I think what I will do is I will record a very short little snippet video on the playlist going through this one because it's not hard. Um, but I want the reason why I want to record this one off to the side is I really want to take some time and go through three-dimensional equilibrium very well, and I don't want to be rushing 3D land. And I don't believe this problem affects the homework assignment that you've been given anyway. So I think it's probably uh, all right to sort of do off to the side and you can watch on your own. The pulley problems that we did in class just now, those are the ones that are a little bit more uh, directly uh, applicable to the homework assignment. Any questions? All right, I'm going to pull up the QR code one more time. That's all I have, everybody. We'll see you all on Monday.